Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books in Miami, Florida, I welcome you to a virtual afternoon with David Thompson and Jeff Dyer to discuss their new books. David Thompson's new book is A Light in the Dark, A History of Movie Directors, and in it, the celebrated movie critic gives us an essential work on the preeminent, indispensable movie directors and the ways in which their work has forged and continues to forge the landscape of modern film. Thompson is the author of more than 25 books, including the Biographical, Biographical Dictionary of Film, biographies of Orson Welles and David O. Selznick, and the pioneering novel Suspects, which was peopled with characters from film. Jeff Dyer's newest book is Seesaw, Looking at Photographs, a lavishly illustrated history of photography in essays. Dyer has been writing about photography for 30 years, and this tour de force of visual scrutiny and stylistic flair gathers his lively engaged criticism over the course of a decade. Dyer is the award-winning author of many books, including But Beautiful, Out of Sheer Rage, Zona, on Andrei Tarkovsky's film Stalker, and the essay collection, otherwise known as The Human Condition, winner of a National Book Critics Circle Award for criticism. Throughout this afternoon's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of A Light in the Dark and Seesaw from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello. Hi. Good Hello. to see you. Hi. Hi, David. Hi, Jeff. Um, I want to say I've known you quite a while. I've read lots of your books, not all. Uh, this is a fabulous achievement. I know that these pieces have been gathered over the years, but it seems to me that for millions of people, you have identified the special predicament and pleasure of looking at photographs in a way no one has done so well before in such a beautifully designed book and really wonderfully written. I think if I can say so, looking and writing about photographs has enriched your style. There's a clarity to the book that's quite amazing. And I just want to tell you, I'm in awe of the book. Thank you. Now, now, I had a question that I thought might launch us off usefully. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a photograph that was taken, I think, in 1936. It's a shot of a soldier on a front in the Spanish Civil War falling. And clearly, when that picture was first seen in 36 and the years afterwards, it was an incredibly powerful confrontation with fact and reality. And I'm sure that it was used to raise funds and raise support for the Republican cause in the Civil War. All to the good. I think it's not a very interesting picture. Mm -hmm. And in part, that's because it could have served the other side just as easily. We don't know who this man is, what side he was on. But then gradually, as time passed, people began to work it out that the picture might be fake. Mm -hmm. And I think by today, I think it's right, you would confirm this, it's generally thought to be fake. Now, for me, in becoming fake, it becomes a much more interesting picture oh. because, it, because it marks a moment where photography's fundamental initial confrontation of the factual world and us breaks down and photography Rouse, raises itself up as a force that can 
interfere with fact mm -hmm. and can dispute our relationship with fact. Is that an interesting question? It's a very interesting question because, of course, it goes uh, so beyond the uh, the Robert Kappa picture that uh, that you're addressing. Um, and yeah, I think, I mean, perhaps I disagree with you to an extent, though. Um, I mean, I'd begin by agreeing with you. That is to say, I would quote that famous line of um, George Bernard Shaw's, uh, which uh, that magnum photographer, Philip Jones Griffiths, was always keen on quoting. And that's when John George Bernard Shaw says, you know, there's all these oil paintings of the crucifixion. But the truth is, wouldn't we exchange them all for just one snapshot of the yeah. crucifixion? And he says, that's what photography has got going for it. And then we fast forward to the period of the Vietnam War when Philip Jones uh, Griffiths says, you know, that's it, because the photograph proves that there was a massacre at My Lai, that napalm was used on the road, all this kind of stuff. So what I would say, David, is that I think in a way, the documentary or evidential value of photography remained intact um, for a long while after that Kappa shot. We were aware, of course, that Trotsky could be airbrushed from history, but I think for a long, for I think for a long while after um, the, uh, the, the, sec the Spanish Civil War, the Second World War, you'll remember Susan Sontag very famously you know, said that she thought she could sort of divide her life in two from the moment before she saw pictures of the concentration camps as a teenager and thereafter. So yeah, it's documentary value, I think remained intact for a, for a very, very uh, lo long time. Um, then of course, it's, uh, I mean, technologically, uh, it's become easier and easier to, to manipulate things. And I think the, 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 uh, the degradation or the devaluation of photography as a document has coincided with its ever greater in sort of value as a, a, a as as an art form. So now there's quite a lot of uh, overlap, of course, between documentary news and uh, and uh, and art photography. But since let's let's move this over. And by the way, I mean you were so nice about my uh, about my book, so I, I should make clear to everyone that I've <laughs> I've done my homework. <laughs> It's just a fraction of the, the Thompson section of my... Uh, of you're, my you're stronger than I am. I couldn't lift them. <laughs> but I thought, yeah, so what you've been saying, of course, it applies even more to um, to uh, uh, fil to documentary films. Yes. Now, on the one hand, it's it's interesting. You've been quite, in the, in the dictionary, you're quite contemptuous of the Wiseman approach of just let the, you know, let the cameras roll for you know, 200 years or whatever, and then edit it down to 50 years worth of, of stuff. But that element of contrivance, of things having to be fabricated in order to achieve a documentary record, of course, the stakes are are so much, uh, well, the, the, the question becomes so much more complex in a, in a, in a film, doesn't it? And I yeah. wonder, it, I'm conscious that um, I, you don't spend much time on documentary film directors in, in 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 your in your new book perhaps you could you could comment on that i i think it's an omission it's a failure and uh, it's uh something i'm not happy with in the book um i knew when i set out to do this book it was a book of a certain length mm -hmm. and i was going to have to leave out so many people who deserve to be in there and i feel bad about that and i feel guilty about that and there should be a documentary filmmaker in there. And if I could pick the one now, I would do Chris Marker, who is much more than just the documentary filmmaker, but had his roots in documentary. And I wonder, do you feel a time is coming when it seems fanciful to expect the world, the public, to trust photographs. Mm -hmm. And that applies to movies too, mm -hmm. because our power of interference in it, which can be immensely artistic, is that undermining that confrontation with fact that everyone treasured for like a hundred years with mm -hmm. photography? 
Well, it's so interesting because, okay, there's that thing of uh, where you uh, you digitally, manip you sort of go in and physically change the photograph, removing somebody or, or adding something. But then before that, there's that long history whereby, you know, you would come upon a scene uh, and you would think in the case of the Alexander, uh, uh, the Alex Alexander Gardner photograph from the Civil War of, you know, the dead sharpshooter. And you think, OK, you know, it looks good, but let's move, you know, let's 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 just move things around a bit. And then there's that discussion that, you know, with our, um, with um, uh, what's his name, er Errol Morris, you know, with his kind of forensic yeah. examination of the um, uh, of, of, of the cannonballs in the in the Fenton uh, photograph from from the from the Crimea. So there's that. But then I think it gets much more complicated. And it's something that I think. Gary Winogrand was the person to really document this. That is to say, in his book, Public Relations, that is to say the event which uh, the, photo the photographer records faithfully, but the thing is the event was staged in order that it might be photographed. So yeah. then we get this thing of at what point does the, does the, does the uh, contrivance uh, begin? But could I go back to Chris Marker uh, for a yeah. moment? Uh, David and of course you know I mean of all the I mean I could if if let's suppose this conversation was to be of Wiseman like length I could just happily we could spend you know years where I pick out my favorite bits from the dictionary but there's that great bit where uh, you know I think in uh, I can't remember which edition it is but you say okay in an earlier edition I said he was born in um, where is it in Mongolia Ulaanbaatar Ulaanbaatar yeah. And then you say you've learned that he was actually born. Where was he actually born? Near Paris, I think, as right. I remember. You know, yeah. In this great moment in a book of reference, you know, since we're talking about the reliability of things, where you say, well, you know, actually, it's all around much better if we, if you know, I prefer the uh, the Ulaanbaatar version. And what what you may not know is that I had dinner with him here in the Bay Area, at Chez Panisse, in fact, and with a perfectly straight face, he assured me he had been born in Ulaanbaatar. <laughs> okay. there's, a, there's a long history of that, you know, when in doubt, print the legend kind of thing. Ab ab absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Um, but I think he's a really exa uh, interesting example because one of the, I mean, one of the sort of uh, framing questions in your book is this thing of what is a director? Is it just the person is uh, you know who says cut or you know? And Al Alan Parker, the British director, was very hostile to this idea of the auteur, wasn't he? Because he said, "Well, you know, I'm just one of many people. You've got to consider, of course, the actors, blah blah blah, all of this kind of stuff." But yeah. it's to me that in this realm of documentary, interestingly, you've got some people like Chris Marker who is un ambiguously an auteur he really is uh you know respond he so he writes the stuff you know it's filmed it's edited it's completely something like sans soleil is completely his work and absolutely it seems to me it's quite interesting now that you know if we're talking about the you know who are the the um the people we would say are at, you know, any rubbish film comes out now, and the first thing you see on screen is a it says a film by X or Y. That's right, and it's got no. It's just a piece of hackery. But it I has no sense of authorship at all. No, yeah. nothing yeah. at all. And you can tell that within a you know sometimes yeah. almost within thirty seconds of that fading, you can tell it's a work of hackery. But isn't yeah. it interesting that you know? I think you would agree that one of the great auteurs at at the moment uh, who is dis who is displaying his autonomous by that unfallible, infallible way that actually there are occasional signs of self-parody now, but it would, of course, be Adam Curtis, who, interestingly, doesn't even want to think of himself as a film director. You know, he says, I'm just a journalist. But, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's, yeah. it's interesting that of just where the, where the, the essence of autorhood or autonomous can, can reside. It's, ex it's extraordinary, too that in an age in which it is supposedly harder and harder for independent-minded people to make interesting films, that Curtis can go to the BBC and let them do, and let him do just about everything he likes 
and there seems to be no interference, no critique. I'm not saying I want that, but it's an incredibly, I mean, we're talking about his most recent film, which is played in Britain, not in America. Mm. Um, it, it's an amazingly paranoid, egotistical film. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of crazed. Yeah. And it's a very important part of it that his quite lucid, clear, amiable, nagging voice narrates the whole damn thing. And yeah. I don't know about you, but when I saw that film over a period of, I don't know, three days or whatever, like a song refrain, his voice was hanging in my head for days. Yeah. And whenever someone spoke to me, I sort of said, do they sound like Adam Curtis or what? <laughs> it's an amazing achievement. And the BBC let him do it. Yes, and uh, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right about the voice, but this was a fantasy. You know, there are also, there are so many of these, these sort of, yes. that particular it, phrasing of his, but this is, I mean, I think in the case of Adam Curtis, it's not that he even has to go to the BBC and say, can I do this? He just <laughs> turns up every day, goes to that little burrow of his where he works and just gets on with it. But I think this is, this gets to, again, gets back to this very interesting point that you, you, uh, you, you deal with in this book and I think it's in the, the whole equation where you where you discuss this as well so all of these every director from let's say Orson Welles onwards they all want they all want freedom and you know or Welles famously after Citizen Kane which he controlled every bit of you know he may, was able to get this thing I can do whatever he want whatever I want you'll give me a load of money and you'll not even be able to interfere with it and it's funny, after that, everything Wells did was sort of interfered with. And you've been quite, uh, I think you've been quite consistent in saying that this ideal of unfettered freedom uh, from all the vulgar requirements of the market as represented by the studio, and of course the example of this that you discuss in several places in the new book is, uh, you know, Chimino and Heaven's Gate. You're actually, you feel that the, in many times the restrictions put upon the artist actually work to the artist's benefit even though of course he or she is kicking and screaming against them the whole time well i, I mean i think it's very plain if you look at the history um take two prospects in recent years do you give martin scorsese 200 million dollars to make the irishman mm -hmm. Or do you give Anna Lily Amapur $50,000 to make The Girl Who Walks Home Alone at Night? Mm -hmm. And which are you looking forward to? Yeah. Which do you value the most after you've seen them? I think that almost the essential of the film school training ought to be, look, here is $100, go and make a film. And that discipline, that constraint, will teach you more about collaboration, mm -hmm. will teach you to respect other people. Um, it's an old truism, but it's true. The money has crippled the films, mm -hmm. and we, the audience, have allowed that to happen. And I just hope that we're at the dawn of an age where the internet will allow us to see mm -hmm. a lot of really pitiably cheap films because pitiably cheap films, whether they're made by Bresson or someone else, I think are so much more promising than Tenet, you know, films like that, yeah. Mank, you know, I mean, incredibly bloated pretensions and ego trips, really ego trips. Um, and the, the, no, go on. So the pivotal figure in the book, I mean, as always, I mean, it is, and I think this is maybe a, a generational thing. I mean, Goddard is the, the crucial figure in this, I think, in that, you know, whatever it is, I can't remember the sums involved, but yeah, he sort of gets on and sort of, you know, makes these films with what any, whatever money was was available. And, and also the thing about Goddard is that you take a film like Pierre Le Fou, which is one of, his great films, I think, certainly one of my favorites. He says, he said, candidly, I think, two days before he began, he didn't know what it was going to be. I mean, that's like a still photographer walking down the street, holding his camera, 
Mm -hmm. He doesn't know what he's going to photograph. Yeah. That that hesitation, I think, is one of the most wonderful things about still photography. I, I don't know what you feel, but I feel the more thought has gone into a picture, probably the l less time it's going to last. Is there something in that? Yes. Well, there's this wonderful uh, thing of, yeah, you, uh, you know, the, the classic street photographer, you, you go out and you just don't know what's going to happen. And you make sure that you've got, uh, you know, you make sure you've got a variety of lenses, all this kind of stuff. But of course, the whole I mean, so, so often, I mean, I like the idea of improvising in films, and then so often it turns out to be uh, to be disastrous. So I always think of, um, you know, that great uh, collaboration, failed collaboration between Timothy Leary and Charles Mingus. So you think, oh, wow, that sounds promising. <laughs> but as Mingus said to Timothy Leary, he said, you know, man, you, you've got to improvise on something. You can't improvise on nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and because yeah. of everything going on with, uh, you know, it's such a big production making a film, you know, uh, in some way you've got that Hitchcock thing where he says he's got it all worked out in his head and then from then on all you've got to do is just, you know, uh, realise it. And you want some sort of balance between that and some completely kind of thing of, of, of just uh, just seeing what, what's happened. Yeah. Uh, and then but to, to go back to what you say, I mean, this question of budget is so i think so interesting if you think of a really i mean i thought for a while his early films were great but i think there is no i'd have to go a long way before i could i'd struggle to think of a film that was any worse than uh, vim vendors uh, towards the end of the world where you felt with that uh, film the main problem he was grappling with was just how am i how am i going to get how am i going to spend some more of this money i got let's go somewhere else and blow another 20 yeah. million or whatever it was where yeah. the best thing is with uh with uh with uh you know being a photographer it was always pretty cheap now even then uh, if we go back to the analog thing there was still that crucial component that uh that i that that, that, that we've mentioned of budget i you know there's 36 shots on a film so you'd have right. to, you'd have to uh, you know change the thing there'd be the the cost of it you know so there would there would be that limitation on it whereas now of course there is none of that because you can just uh, you know even the distinction actually this is quite useful for our conversation the very distinction between a still image and a moving one is starting to collapse so my phone because i can't control the settings it photograph it's not a completely still image i get a few a few sort of milliseconds before the thing i want to do so that thing of that crucial thing of choosing the moment, which was so much about uh, uh, what defined a great photographer, not just for Cartier-Bresson, but even for a, a heavy shooter like Gary Winogrand. Yeah. Uh, there would be that choice to be made. But I think then, to go back again to what you were saying, it was so interesting, this thing, that you would go out in the day not being sure what you got. And in those pre-digital days, even when Winogrand came back after eight hours on the street, having shot however much, he still didn't know what he got uh, because he'd have to wait for that magical thing of the image in all its mystery appearing in the developing tray. And you know, totally. That, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. I mean, one of the most glorious things in film school was waiting a day or maybe longer to see what you'd got. The other thing I would, as you were talking, it came back to me, the physical, physical emotional pleasure in the dark of loading a magazine of celluloid mm -hmm. into a camera and, you know, making the loops, the smell of the mm -hmm. film stock. Um, amazingly profound experiences that I think went into photography and it's changed. And I'm sure those things have been replaced by other sensations. But uh, I wonder, no, go on, you were going to say something. Yeah, well, what about, I mean, this is quite nice where we're heading now. So what about, uh, I think this is, uh, so as we were, I mean, we can, there are many examples that come to mind. There's lots of films featuring photographer, photographers, yeah. but that thing of the still photographer not being sure what they've got means that we have to talk about Antonioni and blow up uh, surely and of course there we've got that uh, 
it's a it's a you know it's a wonderful thing because it turns out it's photographed a murder possibly but possibly. That, lovely, that lovely conceit whereby the more he blows the picture up weirdly uh, the sort of clearer it gets yeah uh, and i just thought if it be if can you what about other portrayals uh, depictions of uh, the photographer at work in in the cinema it seems to me that we might uh, anyway let me leave it at that and then i'll no 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 i mean i can't come up with anything remotely as impressive as blow up i'm sure there are other things but i wanted to ask this um as i was reading your book having a great time with it i i i remembered i felt i've never seen you with a camera mm -hmm. do you t do you take pictures i mean now that i've got uh, now that i've got a phone uh, yeah i do occasionally but i mean very occasionally uh uh, often really it just as a substitute for when I used to make notes or something you know if I see something interesting on the street I'll just take a picture of it but no I it's almost become a, a superstition with me that you know I wrote that jazz book I can't play a note of music uh, right and it's you know so there's that I feel a condition of being able to write about these things is maybe um, that I don't know anything about the process and um, and then, but it's probably just a, it's probably just a, just a, a, a laziness. And what about? And the other thing is, I mean, I live in Los Angeles most of the time now. And one of the great sources of happiness uh, for me is that I've, um, I've never had any urge to, uh, to, to get involved in making films at all. All I want to do is, is watch them. No interest in, in writing scripts and living in Los Angeles has really uh, confirmed me in that. So it's just uh, something like that going on. But I wondered, I mean, just to bring it back again, I think one of the um, sort of areas of disagreement between us might be, I mean, I know that you, uh, you, you regard Easy Rider. I think you say it's just a disaster in the, the history of filmmaking because the, the, king, the keys to the kingdom are given to the young. And I think quite often now with cinema going I realize, you know my enjoyment of a film is irrelevant because I'm so entirely outside of the demographic that films are, are pitched at for the most part but um, anyway whatever we think of, of Easy Rider I think Dennis Hopper is such an interesting figure uh, because I think he, he it ended up that he was a really really amazing photographer in fact you make that case in the book and i'm persuaded by it uh whereas he was a very very variable actor pretty mm -hmm. bad director i think you might agree on but yeah. i mean blue velvet is an extraordinary performance yeah. and it, it's a performance that is absolutely central to the film mm -hmm. and he was clearly i met him a couple of times he was an amazing alarming person and I'm sure he was as alarmed as other people were in a way. Um, but you made the case for him as being a real artist as a photographer. Yeah, I think so. And, and uh, very much Californian too. And, um, um, sorry, David, go on. No, uh, no go on. Uh, I was gonna ask about some, uh, I think there's this sort of traffic between uh, those who are still photographers and sort of filmmakers and vice versa it's quite interesting because you know there's that thing as we know Henri Cartier-Bresson was uh, an assistant to, to Renoir absolutely to, uh, to make significant films I don't know if you share my very low opinion of the films that Robert Frank uh, went on to to make but it seems to me it's uh yeah it's it's not that easy it turns out to go from being uh, a, a, a a photographer still photographer to being a, a filmmaker um you know there's the tarkovsky polaroids they're they're interesting but interesting in the way that polaroids always are that is to say as souvenirs right do you, right well, do you have any thought on thoughts on this uh the traffic well, I, the I think i think one of the crucial differences between the two forms is that movie is about passing time mm -hmm. and photography is about still time and and in a certain way dead time yeah and if you think of that moment in la jetée where a sequence of still photographs 
is suddenly interrupted by a quite brief shot of a young woman not doing anything, but being alive in passing time. Mm. It's one of the most extraordinary moments in film history, I think, yeah. in the sense that it says, well, you think you know frame by frame what is happening, but watch those frames in sequence mm -hmm. and something quite different is occurring yes. and really mysterious. And it sort of, it gets you back to that confrontation with nature. The, and, and you can't beat a moment in a film, I think, where someone, a character, an actor, changes their mind and where with tiny shifts in the face and the features, you feel that change is occurring and you sort of, you identify with it to a degree. And I think that is a great distinction between the two forms. And I think it's very understandable that still photographers are intrigued by film, but not not not, not natural at it, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. and, and and um but you know here's the other thing and the the phone you were talking about has brought this back with a incredible force the the photograph is a vital currency in the way we all live and always mm -hmm. has been um you probably now like as i do you look at a certain collection of photographs of your childhood and you sort of say, was my childhood as strange as these photographs make it seem? Because I don't remember it in that way, but something was there in the appearance of it that is frightening, but wonderful too. Mm -hmm. And people look at photographs of themselves as much as I think they ever did in the late 19th century when photography became mm -hmm important and you don't talk about sort of selfie photography too much in your book but it's a factor out there i mean my kids are avid collectors of thousands and thousands of images none of which are distinguished mm -hmm. except that they represent nodes and moments mm -hmm. in their time and they, they look at them. I've seen them looking at them, like sorting through an archive almost. And almost everyone has that facility and function in their lives now because of this phone, which is only going to get more sophisticated. Well, yes, absolutely. And on this thing of selfie, I mean, it's, I know it's, it's pointless to name drop, but as my wife and I were walking out to dinner last night, we came across. We, we we came past what was we we walked past what was obviously some young kids getting uh, selfies taken with a celebrity, and uh, just in the, it was they were having their pictures taken with Stormzy. It was a great great moment. Uh, so yeah, that we we saw that. Let's see, David. I'm very conscious that at about this time we're opening up for questions, but I really want to. Uh, there's one thing that I feel we have to. Uh, well, that I want to mention because it's there's just a nice thing about this. The very last piece in my book is about you know the person who has meant so much to me uh right. john berger you know yes. uh, uh, one of the, the sort of three important writers on photography for me roland Barthes totally. and sontag but yeah. john berger i mean i seem to remember am i right in saying you were the copy editor on one or two of those early Berger books, such as "What well, a Fortunate Man" and "Success and Failure of Picasso." At one I, wa I was, I was, the, I was the copy editor on "A Fortunate Man," and I remember very well the day he came into the Vigo Street office, and we sat down and dealt with a few tiny queries because he was so meticulous in what he did. It was not that there were problems on the text, but probably problems that I didn't understand. <laughs> but we t we we talked them through, and uh, he was very amiable. He was very polite and considerate, and and I treasure that occasion. Yes, mm -hmm. and a fortunate a fortunate man. I don't know how you rate it in his oeuvre altogether, but I know when I read it, and I, because I was copy editing it and preparing it for the printer, I spent a lot of time on it. That book changed me. 
mm. in the way I was reading it. And I, 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 I had not realized there could be books like that. Yes, no, I, I mean, formally it's so innovative because with, uh, yeah. uh, with uh, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, okay, you've got Walker Evans pictures at the beginning, then you've got the text, but this, right. uh, the way that the images and the text work work together. Work together, extraordinary. I think, yeah. He's, he's, he's a great, great man, and, and uh, uh, I envy you the times you spent with him, but the short time I spent with him was very rich, very welcoming. And then just very, very briefly, and then of course he writes these three films that uh, uh, collaborates on these three films with Alain Tane, who's, uh, I, I mean, uh, I think Jonah, who will be 25 in the year 2000, was a marvelous film. Uh, yeah. And uh, then the film that he goes on to make after Berger, or maybe it's before, uh, In the White City, with, is it with Bruno Gantz? Bruno Gantz, fantastic uh, film. But he's uh, I mean, he's sort of rather forgotten about now. I think. Tenor. I know, I know, and, and you know, uh, I went to Lisbon once, you know, where that film is set, and it was eerie, the sense that I knew that city just from mm -hmm. that one film, and, and I guess that's a certain kind of documentary strand working in a fiction film because uh, he. It's this all this super eight footage allegedly shot. Uh, by, by that, that's yeah. right. He yeah. could have done the film in any city, but he chose Lisbon, and by God, he got Lisbon too. Yeah, he yeah. really did. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I think we. I'm very Are aware. We, we're, we're meant to be. Is that right? We're meant to be having. We're going to go interactive at this point. Christina has appeared, so I'm sure we are. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to have a little bit of a Q and A. And I'll just remind everyone watching that now is a good time to post your questions in this Ask a Question feature. Um, we have a question from my boss, Mitchell Kaplan, who's watching. Okay, he would like to know, how does the movement to TV change the creative process of the author? Uh, well, long form television, streaming, binging, whatever you want to call it, I think is enormously important because it has reassessed the role of the director. All of a sudden, the writer uh, and actors, but the writer above all, has become enormously important. And uh, I think it's a very open question at the moment whether the public that keeps saying it wants to go back to movie theaters, whether they actually will go back to movie theaters. Uh, I'm not sure. I think the habit fairly quickly acquired of sitting on your sofa and watching night after night, binging, Breaking Bad, Babylon Berlin, I think that has taken hold profoundly. And I do think it's changing the sort of respect we owe to directors because other people are clearly instrumental in these forms. And for me, some of the shows I've just been talking about naming uh, and the Underground Railroad should be added, uh, absolute masterwork, I think. Uh, these television films are better than anything being made in movie theaters at the moment, I think. Could I say something with regard to that as well, David? I, I sort of I think of something. I mean, for me, the very best of these series, uh, that five-season French series, Le Bureau. Yep. Which I believe. I mean, you'll probably you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think until the last two episodes of the last season, uh, it was all very much uh, the the sort of vision. One person had real control over that. And then at the last moment, sort of handed over the reins. So there's another interesting example there of auteurship. I mean, I don't yep. know if you share my high opinion of of that series. I do. You, I was I was conscious that I never used to watch TV series much before the pandemic because I loved cinema so much. I wanted, you know, I wanted the cinematic experience. But then I sort of I made that change as everyone did. Uh, and but then I'm conscious that. Um, 
uh, I saw that great film. I think it's one a masterpiece, Another Round. We saw that on our TV screen when it was uh, streaming. And then coincidentally, the very night it won the Best Foreign Picture Oscar, we saw it in the cinema. And oh. we realized there was so much of it that we'd lost um, by watching it uh, on on our on our you know quite nice television screen and for me it was a wonderful reminder of that thing which as you said one can so easily forget the unfathomable wonder of the of seeing something on the big screen so you remember lots of those shots in those long scandinavian twilights right where his face the actor his, his face is nearly silhouetted but actually on the cinema screen you can sort of see a bit more into the silhouette and it was a, I, we thought it was a great experience on TV, but we realized it was a really profound cinematic experience as well. Well, I, I, I echo what you're saying, but I would add one thing, which is going in the other direction. And this is not very much talked about by critics. The quality of the image on your home TV set is superior to anything you will find in a theater. It's brighter. It's more detailed. Try it out, test that out. It's amazing, the quality mm -hmm. that modern TV screens have, and that's only gonna get greater because it's not entirely visual, it's, ele it's electronic. But there's, well, there's other things to bear in mind though, David. I mean, the, the, the totality of the concentration that you have to bring to, that you bring to the, to the anyway, anyway, yeah. And it's being with other people. It's, yeah. being, with, it's yeah. being with strangers who have something like your feeling about it, too. Yes. It's the communal experience, too. Changes yes. everything. Yeah. Underground last... Railroad is a masterpiece. Uh -huh. I think so. It is. I, a ma so. I would say, and to me, it's like, I feel like it's a cross between Terrence Malick, Jordan Peele, and of course, just Barry Jenkins, like being just. It is, but you know, it's it's, it's more so than well done. Oh my god! It's gosh. more than just a movie because it it makes startling shifts in its storyline mm -hmm. without explanation. We're going here now. It doesn't tell you that. Exactly. It just assumes the structure that you will follow on. Is it's, so interesting. It's about America in the nineteenth century, and. Experts will know the costumes year by year almost. It doesn't refer to the Civil War at all. And you suddenly realize halfway into it, that the Civil War is an entirely white construct. It was not an event for black culture as it was for white culture. And there are things like that happening. The way the railroad is made physical and actual, ex extraordinary. Great work. Truly, truly. So here's a question for both of you. Um, can you both give us some examples of your favorite films or photographs or photographs and films that just changed you, in that were pertinent in your life and changed you somehow? Oh, I can give a sort of answer to that because um, I was asked recently to contribute, uh, uh, to make a contribution to a, an anthology of uh, about um, uh, uh, photographs that have changed your life. And I realized that I have this uh, general objection to this uh, idea of one's life being changed. I mean, I never like, I never read novels if on the blurb on the back it says a day or an evening that will change people's lives forever. Because I th I'm a great, I'm sort of, unless you're really unlucky and you get hit by a car or something like that, after which you can't walk again or something like that. I am much keener on the force of the gradual and the imperceptible as a as a as a as a as a thing of change. And I'm very conscious that my appreciation of photographs was gradual. Uh, and also with films, I just I mean there were films that I quite liked seeing, but it was um I think it would be I would be altering history if I was able to uh, isolate a, a life-changing uh moment in my experience of, of cinema, even though I might be lazily tempted to go once again for Stalker by Tarkovsky. How about you, David? Well, I have a still photograph of my mother wearing a white nightdress in our back garden 
in the in the moonlight that moves me so much and i think it was taken before i was born but i don't know mm. but the picture i don't know who took it the obvious answer is my father took it but to think that my father took this intensely romantic image of his wife in a relationship that i remember as being dreadful <laughs> it shakes up my entire sense of my life and it's not a particularly great photograph although it does have moonlight which you know in the late 30s if it was taken then was a little unusual probably mm -hmm. uh it it it's an example of a picture that could not mean anything really to anyone else but means an extraordinary amount to me yeah oh that's great david because you really are now sounding like roland bart talking about the so-called winter garden photograph of his mum you know that's that's <laughs> right that's right yes yeah 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 okay let's see what else we have here Someone would like to know what films should we not miss that have just come out? Oh, okay. Uh, well, I think um, uh, if it, uh, another round, I think it's, well, you know, the Oscars, it's so, it's such a cretinous event normally, but yeah. uh, this occasion, actually, I think more often they get the foreign picture right. Um, and then I think the other one for me, I mean, and it's, I was, I saw it, uh, it was the last film I saw pre-lockdown in Santa Monica. But then I just read a review in a British paper today suggesting that it's just now getting a uh, theatrical release here. And that's uh, uh, Kelly Reichardt's uh, first car. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I thought it was, um, you know, I thought, that, I thought it was great in so many ways, mainly because it just made you aware of just what a bore these sort of things. You know, we're all apparently the fate of the cinema uh, the desk, you know, is it going to recover? It all hands, hangs on this forthcoming James Bond film, which allegedly is so great they never dare release it. And, you know, and then, of course, Tenet, who was such a t total bore as well. And yeah. me, First Cow, is really, it's just so, fu it's full of suspense. It was wonderful. And, uh, again, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to see that in a, in a theatre, and it really merits... Uh, uh, a theatrical release. Those would be my my two. Well, I've I've already named the thing that I would uh, stress: Underground Railroad, which I don't really even think as a movie. I think it's um, I don't know. It it's got the size of a big novel. It's got the intensity of an opera. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a great musical score. Um, it's so far beyond anything I've seen in a theater. Mm -hmm. uh that I, I i would stress that and, and i think and this is really intriguing although barry jenkins has a high reputation although it's been much promoted uh i think there is a resistance to seeing the film that mm -hmm. is not inseparable from the racism that we all to some degree live with Mm -hmm. and, and so I would say see that film and as soon as you've seen it you'll want to see it again yeah. just like just like Babylon Berlin which I think is a masterpiece too it's a difficult series to watch uh, but, it but sure it's is. well worth it and I think most people just don't have the patience to spend the time you know that's needed to actually look at this at the underground railroad and feel you know all the emotions are like so spread out and it's just yeah it's a work of art and you not know, everyone there's can something deal else with it. there's something else with skirting and i think it's got to be said a lot of white people don't want to look at black people and I that think, goes that goes to the roots of our culture I think you're 100 percent right um so another question which it kind of leads into this um someone would like to know how does one look what do you look for that's it wow, wow. that's a bit late to ask a question <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, i don't know i don't know well 
I had a thing with students when I taught that uh, worked like this. I said, go into a movie, preferably go into the movie after it started <laughs> and close your eyes, listen, listen to the wealth on the soundtrack and wait until you have to open your eyes. Mm. And I think that it can freshen up your whole visual participation in a film. Yeah. So tr try that. Um, I, I, I don't have anything to offer to that question, which is a sign of the high quality of the question, actually. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, this is a question for Jeff. What are your thoughts on Sarkowski's looking at photographs? Oh, yes. Well, um, do you know, I'm, I mean, first of all, I guess, I mean, I just so revere uh, uh, Sarkowski. Uh, he's somebody I became conscious of after I become interested in photography. Uh, and unlike the other three, Roland Barthes, Sontag, and Berger, who sort of came to it just sort of you know, as something that interested them, he, of course, had to a very large extent formed, uh, created the landscape of photography that they were curious about because he was such an influential curator of uh, defining what, a, what constituted uh, a photograph during his long tenure at uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So I like that book looking at photographs uh, a great deal. Uh, if I'm remembering that one correctly, it's this sort of, it's a sample of the holdings of MoMA. And I think it's, uh, it has a sort of a picture on uh, the verso page and uh, a short essay on the picture and the photographer on the facing page. So I like that a lot, but the book of his that means even more to me is uh, the same format. That is to say his book on Atjeh, where he has a hundred pictures of Atjeh uh, each picture is on one page, then on the facing page, there's a mini essay. And the, I mean, several things. One, his knowledge of Atje's work within the context of his vast knowledge of the history of photography, which rivals David's history, by the way, of the, the, the history of cinema. And like David as well, he's such a consummate prose stylist. Anyway, so I loved this book of his about um uh, actually so much and all the time I was conscious of that line of Steiner's where George Steiner where he says implicit in any deep reading of any book is the desire to write a book in reply and I wanted from such an early stage to write to do a version of that book I wanted to do a book of you know image on one page three or four hundred word essay on the facing page and for ages I just couldn't think of anyone to do it about and then to um to my great delight, uh, I had lunch with somebody at the University of Texas Press when I was down there, and he said, I know what your next book's going to be, uh, and I didn't. And he said, "It's because uh, he, he, uh, he said, well, we've got the rights to 100 Winogrand images. Do you want to do it? And at the moment he said it, I realized, oh, my God, of course. You know, this is my chance to, to do a book in, in that form, which I'd wanted to do so badly. So... Uh, yeah, uh, I, if the if uh, I mean I'm assuming the questioner has a high opinion of Sarkovsky, however you pronounce the guy's name, but I certainly <laughs> share it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question for Jeff. Um, in film, the editing process is so collaborative. Uh, Jeff, curious about that same process for the still photographer. Yeah, it's. It's crucial, and as we, I mean, God, it's so easy to, every for every question about photography can uh, come back to Winogrand. And, you know, uh, famously, uh, Winogrand was, uh, you know, lost interest in, in the editing of things. I mean, he didn't really, right from the start, he was not, he'd always let other people edit his books, put them together. I think there was maybe just one that he did himself. But crucially, I mean, more radically, crazily, as uh, as many of us know, you know, when he moved to Los Angeles, he continued photographing at this phenomenal rate, uh, but then abandoned uh, doing studio uh, exhibition prints, then abandoned doing studio prints, abandoned doing contact sheets, by which time it's getting pretty disastrous. And then beyond that, didn't even bother um, 
uh, developing the, the film. So he's shooting without um, without having any idea of what he's got. And then it turns out after his death, when all of this um, stuff was became available, quite often it turns out he was photographing pretty well nothing. So it seems to me that the, it's why I'm not saying anything very original here, but this process of, of editing is not just something you do after you've been photographing it's integral to the to the it's as important to the process of uh, of being a photographer as uh, shooting the the things themselves and then when it comes to editing the stuff in a in a book well there's so many examples of uh, this thing of uh, you know of uh, how the material is one thing but it's the sequencing of the images that is so important. So I think the famous example of that would be the, uh, the Americans. I'm forgetting now the name of the really important figure who uh, you know did that, took to, who, who made the mass of material that Frank had shot into a book. But yes, it's absolutely, it's absolutely uh, crucial. And I think the thing is that um, some photographers uh, can do it on their own, but more more often I think they're very uh, amenable to the uh to the helpful intervention of uh of a of, of the of, of the publisher good stuff fabulous thank you so we're coming up on the hour so yeah. i think um we'll call it a day um but i want to thank you both for a brilliant conversation i wish this could go on and on uh, maybe we can do a second part live in person in miami at some point <laughs> well perhaps we thank you and mitch and the bookstore thank you Jeff. so much i thank you uh, and you know uh, david this wasn't our first rodeo together and i'm optimistic no. it ain't gonna be the last that's right <laughs> yeah good okay thank you all so i just thank want to remind all. everyone watching that if you haven't already ordered your copy of a light in the dark and seesaw you can do it by just pressing that green button at the bottom of the screen and we'll ship it right off to you. And if you're in Miami and you want to come by one of our stores, we have them there as well. So thank you so much for watching from everywhere. Um, thank you for a great conversation. Thank you for supporting independent bookstores. And um, we love your work. We're huge fans and very, very grateful to you for today. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Great.